glad to have lived long enough to be in a church where that music would be understood to be just stunning. Let's just let the silence go on a little longer. Back in 1991, I was offered a position as a pastor in a church in South Oklahoma City. I kind of wonder what my life would be like had I taken it. <laughs> the draw for me then was the, that they uh, would allow me to do a PhD in literature at the University of Oklahoma, which had a wonderful program uh, while I was their pastor. Um, and. South Oklahoma City, the area around there was also a place you could buy a house for next to nothing. Um, the houses we were most interested in at the time were in a new development between Oklahoma City and Norman in a small city called Moore. Uh, and I ended up uh, going instead to Ashland, which put me on a different tra trajectory entirely. Eight years later, uh, every house that we had toured in that subdivision in Moore, Oklahoma, was obliterated by a tornado. Uh, down to the foundations, not a stick of wood remained. They rebuilt, and then 14 years later, in 2013, it happened again with the exact same result. So the text this morning is one crazy story, if you listened. It's a story of Jesus as a tornado. Instead of fixing everyone's problems, he leaves a path of destruction in his wake. Instead of feeding thousands of hungry people, which he'd done before, uh, in this neck of the woods, uh, their food source, pigs, is driven off a cliff because of him. Instead of inviting a new disciple into the group, he refuses a man who wants to follow him. No matter what perspective you look at this text from, it's kind of a mess. From the point of view of the man who was hired to keep an eye on the crazy guy in the cemetery, he loses his job when the madman is made sane. From the point of view of the townspeople, uh, they're source of current and future revenue just ran off a cliff. And from the point of view of Jesus, he's asked to leave town. And from the point of view of the demoniac himself, the man who's in chains in the cemetery, we don't have enough information yet about him, where he came from, what he's about. How in the world did he end up in a cemetery as a home place in the first place. Was he normal before that? It's worth asking because he probably once was just like the rest of us who are, you know, semi-normal most of the time, right? And if we don't ask such questions, we will marginalize him. We will pretend he's different from us and be tempted to surmise that he deserves his sad fate. This is a convenient and self-serving strategy for normal people, right? As if any of us was normal. In reality, it's a delusional way to live because sometime in most lives, 90% of us maybe, we end up spending a season in some dark, dark place. Let me share with you a testimonial from an anonymous someone who has a, a marginalizing disease. He writes, when you have Parkinson's disease and you live alone, you have to pay someone to clean for you, and sometimes you have to take Ubers to doctor appointments. This isn't cheap. 
You'd like to get a roommate to share expenses, but you don't want to advertise on Craigslist because you don't know what kind of person will respond. You find a website that matches women over 50 with roommates. But then you read the frequently asked questions and it says they won't accept anyone with disabilities. One of the aides who helps you in your home says she has a coworker who might be interested in being your roommate. Then the aide sees you on a day when your meds are not working so well and you overhear her on the phone telling the coworker it'd be too much trouble living with you. When you have Parkinson's disease and your friends are getting together for lunch or to go shopping, they sometimes don't call you. It's not that they don't want to spend time with you, it's just more difficult when you're involved. You don't drive, so someone has to pick you up and they have to choose a place that's easy for you to access. You don't get invited on trips to the mountains or the lake or the beach either, even though you'd like to see those places too. You try not to be needy, but you feel less like a friend than an obligation. Friends do help you with errands. They just don't stay to spend time with you after. They have other friends for that. When you have Parkinson's disease, you hope for a new treatment or a cure. You don't want to be remembered this way, but you too are starting to forget the person you used to be. Even in your dreams, you have trouble walking. Back now to the demoniac. He lived a terrible life. He was a despised outcast. But he meets a man who will not allow him to remain an outcast, and that man, of course, is Jesus. And note that this story does not stand alone in the Gospel of Mark. It follows some wild happenings that happened before. Jesus is teaching, and he's interrupted when his mother and brothers arrive and want to take him home to Nazareth because they think he's out of his mind. That's when he tells everyone listening that they're his real family. After that, he's in a boat on the lake with the disciples, and a storm comes up, and soon his disciples rage at him for not caring about them enough because he's taking a nap. It's then that he stills a storm right there, amazing his friends. And directly after that, he stills the storm inside the man living in the cemetery with those demons. And those two stories are literarily equal and are intended to magnify each other. They confirm that Jesus is first a peacemaker Someone with power to still inner and outer storms. Well, if there was a time we needed a peacemaker, it sure would be now, right? As crazy as this world is, he apparently has the power to still our storms, the outside ones and our inside ones. And you know, our reaction to those storms is often fear. And as with the disciples' reaction, out of that fear comes our assumption that the creator of the universe doesn't really care about us. But Jesus confounds that assumption. Even in the midst of the greatest storm, he finds a little bit of blue sky and makes of that a peace. Which is what I want to focus on this morning, because we all need this. So let me repeat that point. Even in the midst of the greatest storms inside us or outside, he makes of that a peace. Now here's a story that the late spiritual teacher and psychologist Ram Dass loved to tell. Many years ago, a woman phoned him at 2 a.m. in the morning. He was on the East Coast. She with someone he knew in California. (laughs) And she wasn't paying much attention to the clock. Besides, she said, she was going to commit suicide. I've gone crazy, she said. Groggy from sleep, Ram Dass still found enough whimsy in the midnight reverie to say, look, you're obviously too crazy to talk. 
So can I please speak to the person who dialed all seven numbers plus the area code because that person must have had some of her marbles. When Ramdas would tell that story, and he told it a number of times, he would go on to say that he believed even in the craziest moments of our lives, even during the greatest storms, there is always, quote, a little bit of blue sky inside of us. We just need to recognize that fact and be willing and able to grasp it. Here's how he put it more generally. He said, we often go along and we are 50% okay and then uh, here comes the depression or here comes that grief again or here comes my anxiety disorder. But look, he said, there is always a part of you that is not anxious, not completely depressed, that little piece of blue sky. The clearest biblical illustration of this reality that I know of uh, is inside, uh, almost hidden, in the story of uh, the prodigal son that Jesus tells. Remember how the young man does something unspeakable. He asks his father for his inheritance, admitting he wished his father was dead. Strike one. Then he goes to a foreign land and goes through that money very quickly and, and uh, on nothing but wild living, whatever that amounts to. Strike two. Then he takes the only job he can in a foreign land, feeding animals that back home they call unclean. Strike three. And finally, smelling the awfulness of the slop he's feeding these pigs, he realizes just how far he's fallen, at which point he just might want to kill himself. But Jesus says that instead of that, he, quote, came to himself and thought of a tiny, sane way back in the direction of his old life. He will go home and not ask for restoration. No, no, he will just ask for a job on his dad's ranch. He must have been out of his cotton pick and mind, but he reaches out of himself for some sanity out of the little bit of blue sky in him. A measured response, right? He's done something unspeakable, but he believes he's more than something unspeakable. He's not, as we say today, the worst thing he's ever done in his life. He's not, and he knows it. That's what we all should work to find in ourselves. The part that's not totally compromised. Today, so many of us, you know, tend to be over-anxious. We, we need to keep breathing. We need to work to find moments of spaciousness within us so that then when our world begins to contract and we feel we're being sucked down a black hole, we will notice it early and we'll ask, why is my heart closing down again? So the first thing we need to do is notice when it happens and recognize that we need not give such suffocating moments full sway. I'm talking about here, here something extremely important that doesn't get talked about that often. The need to detach. And if you want a credible sense of what that might mean, you'll find it in uh, an old book uh, called Tuesdays with Maury, written by Mitch Albin. It's about his friendship with his old professor friend, Maury Schwartz. If you remember the book, you remember Maury was suffering from ALS. And the ALS would make him prone to swallowing wrong and choking. And the choking made him prone to panic. Maury said just to stay sane, he had to learn to detach from the panic. He had to learn that. It was a skill he had to learn. And to detach from it, he found he needed to kind of embrace it first. And here's how he described it to his run, young friend, Mitch. He said, detachment. And, and Mitch said, detachment? Aren't you always talking about experiencing life, all the good emotions, all the bad ones? And Maury agreed with him. 
Then he said, detachment doesn't mean you don't let the experience penetrate you. On the contrary, you let it penetrate you fully. That's how you're able to leave it. Mitch was mystified. Maury went on. Take any emotion, love for a partner, or grief for a loved one, or what I'm going through, fear and pain from a deadly disease. If you hold back on the emotions, if you don't allow yourself to go all the way through them, you can never get to being detached. You're too busy being afraid. You're afraid of the pain, you know. You're afraid of the grief. You're afraid of the vulnerability that loving entails, if that's the issue. But by throwing yourself into these emotions, by allowing yourself to dive in all the way, over your head even, you experience them fully and completely. You know what pain is. You know what love is. You know what grief is. And only then can you say, all right, all right, I've experienced that emotion now. I've recognized that emotion. Now I need to detach from it for a moment. I know you think this is about dying, Mitch, but it's like I keep telling you, when you learn how to die, you learn how to live. Maury talked about his most fearful moments when he felt his chest locked in heaving surges or when he wasn't sure where his next breath was coming from. These are terrifying times, he said, and his first emotions were fear and anxiety. But once he recognized the feel of those emotions, their texture, their moisture, the shiver that came with them down his back, the quick flash of heat that crosses your brain, then he was able to say, okay, this is fear. Step away from it now. Step away. I thought, said Mitch, about how often this is needed in everyday life, how we feel lonely sometimes to the point of tears, but we don't let those tears come because we're not supposed to cry. Or how we feel a surge of love for a partner, but we don't say anything because we're frozen with the fear that those words might, you know, do something to the relationship. Maury's approach was the exact opposite. Turn on the faucet. Wash yourself with those emotions. It won't hurt you. It will only help. If you let the fear inside, if you pull it on like a familiar shirt, then you can say to yourself, all right, all right, it's just fear. I don't have to let it control me. I see it for what it is. Same for loneliness. You let it go. If the tears flow, feel it completely. But eventually be able to say, all right, that was my moment with loneliness. I'm not afraid of feeling lonely. But now I'm going to put that loneliness aside and know that there are other emotions in the world and I'm going to experience them as well. So detachment is the first step in turning anxiety or other negative emotions aside. And the way to get to that first step is to remember we're not uh, the total of our neuroses, right? Don't forget Ram Dass's bit of wisdom. As he said, we often go along and we're 50% okay and then, ah, oh, here comes the depression, or here comes the grief again, or here comes my anxiety disorder. But look, remember, there is always part of you that is not anxious, not completely depressed, that little piece of blue sky. Know that you with the help of that revelation from Jesus, can make of that, even that, a peace.